is my great pleasure to introduce Maud Mandel, who is Professor of History and Director of Judaic Studies at Brown University. Professor Mandel received her undergraduate degree in English from Oberlin College and her PhD in History from the University of Michigan. As demonstrated in her first book, entitled In the Aftermath of Genocide, Armenians and Jews in 20th Century France, Professor Mandel's field of expertise focuses primarily on the impact of policy, policies and practices of inclusion and exclusion on ethnic and religious minorities in modern France. In her fascinating new book that Jonathan just alluded to, and that we're going to hear lots about, Muslims and Jews in France, History of a Conflict, Professor Mandel, to quote Professor Judaikin, uh, gets behind the headlines and examines the two largest communities of both Jews and Muslims living in Europe. In contextualizing the history of how the narrative of sworn enemies irreconcilable differences and rising anti-Semitism has consolidated over time, Professor Mandel investigates the key role post-colonial France has played in creating or denying new pathways for its former colonial subjects. Please join me in giving Professor Mandel a warm Rhodes welcome. dress and I can't attach my mic to the dress so I'm going to hold the uh, remote in my hand as I wander around. Um, so uh, first let me just thank um, Jonathan and Shira for the warm welcome and uh, to thank all of you for coming out. It's really um, a wonderful opportunity for an author to have a chance to talk about uh, her research um, with an interested audience and I'm really looking forward to your questions and comments after the lecture as well. Um, so uh, I'm going to begin where my story in some ways ends, um, and that is in autumn of 2000, uh, when Muslim and Jewish relations in France captured national and international headlines um, as a result of the dramatic spike in anti-Jewish violence that uh, started to take place in the urban working class neighborhoods of France, largely the work of um, working class Muslim youth, often very young people. Um, these events scared Fr the French Jewish community very much and raised alarms that anti-Semitism was rising dramatically in France um, and, and that new ethno-religious conflict was beginning to uh, break out. And for those of you who read the newspaper, you know that there have been rather period uh, periodic, very dramatic cases of bloodshed since then. Um, my talk's actually not going to be about the last 10 years. It's going to be sort of explaining us how we got here. Um, but this, these events have kept the story of Muslim-Jewish relations in the headlines uh, in France and uh, in the United States and other places as well. Um, so as journalists and public commentators and sometimes scholars have begun, as they do, to try to figure out why this is going on. And there have been a number of suggestions and interpretations for why this is, everything ranging from sort of since the time of the Quran, Muslims and Jews have uh, been in a uh, conflictual relationship or um, radical Islamic fundamentalism has turned uh, the Muslim population in Europe against Jews. Uh, some people have argued that, um, and, are, and you'll see this con comes up a little bit as I talk today, have argued that um, social inequities, um, particularly um, lack of opportunity and economic um, uh, blocks facing Muslims' youth have, youth have led to um, out, sort of bursts of outrage, some of which have been directed as Jews. And then a very, very common argument, which you'll hear often in this country as well, which is that um, it is a result, this conflict is the result of the transportation of the, of the Middle East conflict to France or wherever. Wherever Muslims and Jews live, they hate each other, and that's because um, of Israel and Palestine and the conflict that exists there. So when I first set out to write the book project that I'm going to be talking to you about today, um, I was most 
sort of drawn to the point that I knew deeply to be true, which is that the language of polarization was the wrong language, that actually most Muslims and Jews weren't in conflict. And um, I think my first title for the book was uh, Beyond Anti-Semitism, and then some post in Muslims and Jews in France, something like that. Um, and the, the reason I was so convinced about this was because, um, after all, a fairly significant proportion of the Muslim Jewish populations in France come from the same place. They come from North Africa. The first generation of Jewish migrants spoke Arabic um, for the most part. Uh, they shared the same cultural norms, um, some um, even religious practices, oddly, not the literal the liturgy, of course, but some of the traditions were shared in both cultures. They often settled in similar neighborhoods. Uh, they were um, ate the same foods and spent time in the same cafes. Uh, and so I, was, I, I sort of set out to write that story. Uh, but I'm a historian, and I'm not an ethnographer. And one of the things uh, about historians is that historians find their evidence largely in archives, not entirely. There are different kinds of historians. But I'm the kind of historian who goes into archives. And one of the things you realize when you go into archives is the only story, first of all, it's hard to find anything on this topic as such. It's, it's a little bit like needle in the haystack. There's not sort of files on Muslim-Jewish relations, right? So, so I would go through police reports and all kinds of other files of organizations and minutes of meetings. And when I would find traces of Muslim-Jewish relations, surprise, surprise, what I found is conflict. Now, that's not necessarily because Muslims and Jews were perpetually in conflict. It's because they only show up in archives. The only time anybody cares about the relationship is when it's a conflictual one, right? Police write reports after a riot. That's when you get police reports. Um, you find articles in newspapers when people are responding to a moment of conflict. And, uh, and so I started to follow these sources. And with this, my research really evolved from a straightforward challenge of the narratives of Jewish and Muslim conflict into an examination of how these narratives emerged and how, as they emerged, they helped produce the conflict itself. Sort of the more you say that there's conflict, the more people start to believe they're actually in conflict with one another. Um, and that's uh, sort of the direction um, the book took. And so my talk today is going to draw from this research on the evolution of the political meaning of conflict and consider the processes through which the category of Jew, and I'm going to put this in quotes, and Muslim, became political symbols even as actual Muslims and Jews rarely came into conflict with each other um, throughout much of the time that we'll be talking about. And in fact, the very word Jew and Muslims is problematic in some ways because it implies heterogeneity to what were in fact very diverse, uh, I'm sorry, hom homogeneity to what were in fact very diverse heterogeneous communities. And I'm not gonna sort of detail for you all the heterogeneity today right now in the talk. You just sort of have to take my word for it. But if you want, during the question and answer period, I can tell you a little bit more about the diversity that actually makes up both of these categories. But what I will be talking about is how, in some ways, heterogeneity was irrelevant. It was irrelevant to the hardening of the political binary Muslim-Jewish uh, that we're going to be talking about. And the core of this story, as you'll see as I go forward, is going to be France itself. I'm going to focus on France. Um, so I'm not going to talk all that much about the Middle East. It's not that the Middle East was irrelevant. Global uh, developments mattered, and people talked about them a lot. Um, but the nature of the mobilization around the Middle East, who was involved, how rhetoric was employed around this issue, um, very often sort of came about because of a set of political and social and economic and cultural realities uh, in France itself. Um, and so the impact of the Middle Eastern wars uh, and developments in the Middle East were never actually very straightforward. Um, and I'll just read you one quote um, here that sort of captures this. This was a, an Algerian Jew who was interviewed by an ethnographer in the early 1990s. And uh, she said, when we say the Arabs, I feel hatred. But those are Middle Eastern Arabs. I'm not talking about the Arabs who live in France, because they don't do us any harm. They work, they earn their living, they have children and families like us, a la Francaise. That's fine. So what, the reason I read you this citation right now is to point out that to focus solely on the Middle East, only on the Middle East, really misses or overlooks the way in which uh, other aspects of the story are more important, in my opinion, and consistently overlooked. 
Um, so again, this is not to remove the Middle East from the equation. I won't never talk about it, but I'm going to talk about it the way the global, the national, and to a certain extent, the local work together um, to bring about the state of affairs we find ourselves in by 2000. Um, the book, I will say parenthetically, talks a lot about the local. It spends a fair bit of time talking about the city of Marseille. I'm actually not going to talk about that too much today um, because I can't. The book's for sale. You can go buy the book. I can only cover so much in one lecture. But the, the, uh, there is a strong sort of focus on also how particular spaces in um, France end up bringing out certain different aspects of this tension and relationship over time. Um, OK, so just to make really clear then, as in all historical projects, really at base my goal is to make things more complicated, to complicate simplistic understandings of the problem before us, to challenge notions of inevitability, and to force us to ask why and how the past took the shape that it did, or to say differently, to put a, push us against monocausal explanations. That is the idea that because Muslims and Jews fight in the Middle East, ergo, they fight in France. Um, it's, in some ways, it's a, although many of us accept that as fact, it's actually sort of nonsensical when you think about it. Most of the Muslims, or many of the Muslims we'll be talking about who came to France uh, weren't even Arabs. They were Berbers um, and, and from there are many different kinds of ethnic groups in Algeria from where many of them came. Um, the Jews in France uh, for much of the, certainly first half of the century, uh, were actually hostile. Many of them were hostile to Zionism. So the idea that they're sort of inevitably become polarized around the Middle East, even if the Middle East was the central reason they are now polarized, which I'll sort of argue against. I don't even argue that they're entirely polarized. but. Um, we have to explain why that happened. It, didn't, it wasn't inevitable. OK, so to do this, I'm going to focus on three moments in French political history that interest me in the book. Um, one is the decolonization of North Africa. The second is going to be the student uprisings that um, uh, took place in 1968 in um, the sort of radicalization of um, youth political life. And the third is going to be uh, experiments in 1980s French multiculturalism. And I just realized I need to take my watch off so I can keep track of what time it is. OK. Um, and um, we're going to go through each of these very quickly um, uh, so that I can give you a sense of, and for me, I, on a talk like this, I could have just picked one. Um, to give you kind of one chapter or one theme of the book, but I'm really trying to give you a broad overview of the argument and how each layer builds on the layer before it. Um, and so hopefully in giving you a little brief taste of each of these segments of the argument, you'll get a sense of, um, of how of the broader argument that I'm trying to make. Okay, so my story begins then with the, France's decolonization of North Africa. Now this starting point may already surprise. A book on Muslim-Jewish relations in France I suspect at least some of you would think it would start in 1948 with the founding of Israel, if that's what we're thinking, if we're thinking about Middle East and conflict, or maybe even prior to that when um, uh, there are already struggles in Palestine between um, Jews and Muslims um, in uh, the 1920s, late 1920s and early 1930s. Um, but actually, in France, in 1948, there's very little conflict. It's sporadic, uh, but most Jews and um, Muslims in France are largely unaware of each other's presence, uh, and they really don't spend any time in a significant degree of what one might call conflict or polarization or disagreement about the Middle East. Um, in part, this is because they're very different from one another. So most of the Jews in France uh, in this period are um, what we would call Ashkenazic Jews, Jews from U European Jews, uh, from um, from France, some of them are native born, some are from Eastern Europe and Poland. Uh, and the Muslim population in this period is uh, largely an Algerian born um, uh, migrant labor population working in the unskilled trades. They live l overwhelmingly in different places. They don't interact all that much. Um, and in addition to that, where they do interact, there are Jews coming from North Africa even in this period, when they do interact, their relations are largely convivial. They settle in similar neighborhoods. They speak uh, a similar language. They share some certain cultural similarities from the places from which they 
came, uh, and so there's very little conflict um, in this early period. Um, World War II, of course, uh, proved extremely disruptive, primarily for French citizens, uh, Jewish citizens and subjects, but really for everybody in some ways. Um, and by the time it ended, uh, Jews and Muslims had one simple way to put this was more to worry about than each other. Uh, Jews are rebuilding from the very traumatic uh, World War II period when 75,000 Jews were deported um, and uh, the remaining community had been very unsettled. Um, Muslims in France are swept up in, post -col in um, colonial struggle against, uh, uh, independent struggle, excuse me, against uh, France that stretches from after World War II until all of the North African countries um, break away over the course of the 50s and 60s. Um, and uh, they're, so they're, they're sort of swept up with other things. Now it is true that the French Jewish community moves in a much more pro-Zionist direction in this period. Um, not surprising in some ways after World War II. We can talk more about that if you want. Um, but their Zionism is fairly muted. They tend, it tends to be private and talk, think, talked about inside communal um, conversations, it's an internal conversation, it's not a publicly out, uh, outwardly expressed Zionism. And um, there are some Muslims who are, start to become more interested, the, the Algerian nationalist movement, for example, starts to take some interest in Palestinians, but overwhelmingly their interest is focused on breaking away uh, from Fr the French. And so there's actually relatively little conflict in this period as well. Um, and so it's only with French decolonization, when, um, which pushed ever larger numbers of North Africans, both Muslims and Jews, to France, that these dynamics slowly begin to change um, in two ways that are crucial to my story. First was the way the Jewish outmigration that accompanied this process led to new conceptualizations of national belonging for those who left and those who watched them go. And second was the very different conditions of integration that Muslim and Jewish migrants met when they arrived in France. And let me lay these out in turn. So first, I talked about the decolonization, how it sets many Jews moving. Most Moroccan and Tunisian Jews, well, most Moroccan Jews went to Israel. About 10% went to uh, France. About half of Tunisian Jews went to Israel and half went to France. And about 90% of Algerian Jews went to France and only about 10% to Israel and a few other places. I'm simplis simplifying it here. And there were a lot of things that pushed people to choose to leave North Africa. A lot of it was wars of decolonization themselves. It was a very violent and unsettling moment. There was economic upheaval, pretty substantial poverty. Um, it was a very difficult time in all of these countries to imagine a future. Uh, so there are a lot of reasons that Jews chose to leave in these years. Um, but um, if motivations were diverse, departures very often uh, came to be understood as Jewish for many of those with a vested interest in the region. And I argue in this book that the, actually the whole category, North African Jew, was sort of invented in this moment. Um, there really, really is no, nobody really ascribed in the 1950s and 60s to the category North African Jew. I'm a North African Jew. It wouldn't have been a category that they would say. But the category itself sort of gets invented by uh, um, various political actors at the time as they start to think about this population as a, a sort of a homogenous block that's in um, disagreement with those around it. So who's doing this? Who are the political actors who are creating the category North African Jew? Um, there are, th th I think you could break it into three uh, sort of groups of people to help us understand this. The first um, are uh, French officials, French administrators really worried about instability um, in a period of rising nationalism. Uh, and who start to see any kind of sign of disruption as really problematic for their imperial hold. And they, um, so they start to talk about any time there's a small problem, and there are, between Muslims and Jews on the ground and their various political holdings, they start to sort of think about it in more global terms, particularly because of what's happening in the Middle East. Uh, a second group that gets uh, very interested in the plight of North, the plight, and I put the word in quotes as you'll see for a reason, the plight of North African Jews in the 1950s and 60s are international Jewish agencies who are um, mostly focused on European Jewish refugees in these years, of settling them and helping them um, after World War II. Very bad things have happened to Jews as a result of the war. They're very upset, uh, largely, and they're committed to saving Jews for the future. Um, 
most of them had not, didn't know very much about North Africa or North African Jews prior to this time. But as a result of what happened in Europe and as a result of um, the war of Israeli independence in 1948, they start looking at Jews everywhere to say, you know, what can we do to save and help Jews everywhere? And when they look at North Africa, what they see, they, they sort of see through the glasses of the Holocaust. They see the violence and upheaval of World War II um, as a sort of inevitable story that's going to happen everywhere. Um, and so they start talking about um, Jews in North Africa, again, in this kind of category, North African Jew, as um, endangered. So I just want to read you here a citation from, this is a, just an example of many I could give you, in 1950 by a, from a woman who worked for the Joint Distribution Committee, which was a Jewish welfare agency after the war. And she, she argued for... This is her quote. There is a certain danger, and in the source, danger is all in capitals. There is a certain danger which menaces this Jewish minority of a half million souls, lost in a mass of about 20 million Arabs, whose scorn and hidden hostility toward the Jew has been transformed to open hate since the establishment of the state of Israel. Now, for those of you listening, you might just say, well, yeah, of course, that's what was happening. But actually, just if you read the source closely, you'll note even the line that I read you um, lost in a mass of 20 million Arabs. Well, there were Arabs in North Africa, but there were other Muslim um, ethnic groups as well. Uh, and the idea that Jews are polarized against Arabs sort of loses the, the differences between Morocco and Tunisia and Algeria, between cities and country, between wealthy and poor. And it, so you can see a simplification going on. It's not that there wasn't tension, sometimes there was, but it was the reading of the tension through this idea of a, a lost and oppressed minority who you had to save. And the, how these Jewish agencies called to save um, these Jews was through migration. To Israel. Not always, it's not the only thing they did, but they start to make the case that the only answer uh, to really uh, save Jews in the region is by outmigration. Um, and so this, uh, they, they begin emphasizing a discourse of Jewish alienation, alienation and exclusion um, from the entire Arab world. And then a, th a third source for this North African Jew, North African Jewish problem, are the um, the Algerian, Tunisian, and Moroccan Muslim, North African Muslim, excuse me, uh, nationalist movements themselves, which were very careful most of the time not to do that. They tried very hard to argue that Jews are indigenous peoples to the region like Muslims. They should join us in the fight against the French. So Algerian Jews are Algerian, Moroccan Jews are Moroccan first, Tunisian Jews are Tunisian first, that they, um, that they, are, that, that, that they must join us in fighting the colonial oppressor. Um, but the more Jews who left, uh, the more that that argument seemed to take a bit of a beating. And there were people in all of these movements, not always the mainstream spokesmen for the movements, but there were um, individuals in all of them who start to blur the boundaries between Jews and Zionists, uh, between um, Sort of the shared indigenous um, positionality that we that they all felt they had that they were the case they were making that they all shared versus uh, the idea that Jews were somehow outsiders um, to these nationalist movements. So the combined voices of French colonial administrators, international Jewish organizations, and nationalist activists meant that by the end of decolonization, there was a North African Jewish story to tell, a story, and this is really the point that rendered less visible the diverse ways in which Jews and Muslims interacted on the ground and alternative political visions of Muslim-Jewish cooperation. So it's not that there wasn't conflict, sometimes there was, but that conflict was just one way of interacting and this becomes, starts slowly to become the only way of understanding these relationships. Um, but the impact of decolonization, as I suggested, was more than discursive. Uh, that is to say, um, as tens of thousands of Jews and Muslims migrated to France in the wake of decolonization, the ju juridical and social inequalities of French colonialism make their way to the metropole with these Jewish migrants. So what do I mean by that? Um, colonialism itself, French colonialism itself, differentiated among the different indigenous populations that came under French control. And right from the beginning, of French colonial control, particularly in Algeria, and remember I told you that 90% of Algerian Jews go to France, um, fairly soon after uh, Algeria, con France conquers Algeria, um, 
they grant full equality, full civil rights to Jews in the French nation state. This happens in um, 1870 in the Cremieux Decree. Um, and what this had the impact of doing, and this is a long and complicated story, but it juridically cut off Jews from most other Algerian, that is to say, Muslim subjects. Um, and while this process of naturalization didn't happen in Tunisia and Morocco, there was a similar sort of understanding that Jews were more assimilable into European society than Muslims. Uh, and a greater access was given to Jews to, for French education, jobs, opportunities, and the like. And again, this varied among the three North African countries, but in all of them, um, there were inequalities built into French colonialism that then went with Jews and Muslims to France. What does that mean? Well, if you're a, when at the end, in 1962, when France pulls out of Algeria, uh, they collapse Jews into the categories of Europeans who are leaving. So um, Jews are Europeans and therefore citizens, which means in their new home they're going to have access to houses, subsidized housing, they're going to have access to better jobs, re, um, re, uh, reclassment in French professional life. Um, whereas Muslims became immigrants. They had been citizens of the, or at least had for a long time, subjects of the French Empire, briefly citizens at the end, and then suddenly now immigrants. Uh, and they also come in large numbers, but as immigrants, largely unskilled, they end up in poorer neighborhoods, often quite terrible um, shanty towns, uh, the least um, skilled jobs, uh, and um, with more difficult uh, pathway to integrating into the French nation state. Um, in addition, Jews arrived to an established French Jewish community that helped, uh, that helped them. There was plenty of tension between the native French Jewish community and the immigrant community, the Algerian, North Moroccan, and Tunisian Jews who came. But nevertheless, there was an established infrastructure among French Jews to welcome these newcomers uh, and who helped them um, with resources, housing, religious support, social communal institutions. Uh, Muslims had very little of that kind of infrastructure in place um, and, uh, and therefore were much more reliant on French welfare services, which were spotty and not very welcoming to them because after all, uh, they had just fought a bloody war of decolonization uh, against um, uh, many Algerians in particular, and Tunisians and Moroccans. Um, and, so, uh, and so were sort of, sort of less um, open to them. So I'll just read you here. This is uh, what one Jewish observer noted in 1962, um, describing this is an Algerian Jew arriving from Algeria and describing the scene. In a quarter of the airport, someone installs a small counter with stools. The seats are cramped and the signs touch each other. Catholic relief services, Jewish social services, students, Algerian gas and electric employees, and others with more mysterious signs. Each comes to find his own. Only the Arabs have no right to any sign in particular. Having disengaged, they are part of our past, and as such, we abandon them to the good heart of the Red Cross. And so you can just see there an example of, sort of a metaphoric or paradigmatic, I guess is a better way of putting it, example of what um, these different groups were facing. It wasn't the same kind of experience. Um, and so um, this combined impact of asymmetrical integration and communal development processes um, was not invisible to the people coming at the time, as the example I just suggested. Um, and um, actually, I'll just read you, I'd like to read you just one other source. This is from um, an Algerian Muslim who um, had arrived uh, in the early 1940s uh, and had been in, this is in the city of Marseille for a period of time, and he complains, he writes a letter to the mayor complaining about housing inequalities uh, going to, um, to different people. So his own co-nationals from Algeria have to wait for a long time for ha adequate housing, while North African Jews were given preferential access. And so in his words, he says, this practice is not only revolting for its injustice, but particularly for its separatism and for all the hatred it creates. Uh, and so you can see that at least some Muslims start to see the ease of Jewish settlement as a stinging reminder of their own second class status and of ongoing French willingness to favor some citizens over others. So I just read you a little more from his letter. 
I believe that it is the obligation of a politician doubling as an administrator to ensure equality between all citizens so that public services are really used by all and do not favor one fraction of the privileged. So you can see he's framing this as we are all, we are equal newcomers in the French state. We are all uh, subjects or citizens uh, of, the, of the French polity. Um, and he's complaining about inequities. So decolonization then meant both that new discourses of um, political binaries between Muslims and Jews hardened, while at the same time, Jewish North Africans were incorporated as Europeans into the French state. Um, and there were not necessarily immediate conflicts between Muslims and Jews uh, right away. In fact, in places where they do end up settling uh, in the same neighborhoods, relations were largely convivial, again, because they share a lot. They share more than divides them when they first come. But it's also clear that these two indigenous North African populations were on very different trajectories that help us understand later conflicts. OK, so that's decolonization. Now I'm going to move to 1968. So I'm jumping ahead. That doesn't mean nothing happened in between. But, uh, but I'm trying to get to the, the juicy bits, as they say. So, um, so why 1968? In May and June 1968, um, there were widespread uh, student revolts in France. Um, Anarchists, Trotskyists, Maoist groups initiated a set of uprisings that led to the largest general strike in French history. Now here too, you might be surprised in a book on Muslim Jewish um, division that I'm not talking about 1967. Usually we talk about 1967 because 1967 was the year um, of the so-called Six Day War when um, uh, Israel first occupied um, some sig significant pal additional Palestinian territories, uh, but most notably the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. Uh, but actually, that moment had rather little impact on Muslim-Jewish relations in France. In 1967, French Jews become, uh, one scholar has called it the Zionization of French Jews. They become, and it's not just in France, but it was very notable in France, um, very public activist uh, about their Zionism. They march in the streets. They raise a ton of money. Some Jews go to uh, volunteer to go to Israel to fight the war. They, they don't make it because the war ends before they can get there. But they, they volunteer at least. Um, there's great there's great energy and enthusiasm in the Jewish community to support Israel. Um, but in fact, um, this actually has very little impact uh, on Muslim. And I should just say, actually, I'll just add to that, that they're also highly critical of the Arab states. They read, if you read Jewish newspapers of the time, you read very aggressive um, framings of the Arab states. But they say almost nothing, virtually nothing. I could find hardly anything on the Muslim population in France at the time, which had grown enormously. This is not 1948 now. It's grown by leaps and bounds. It's much bigger. And it's if they're, as if they're not there. Jews, the French Jewish population, despite this um, which, if you, if you buy my argument, isn't surprising because uh, much of what ends up happening hasn't happened yet. But, uh, but if you're looking for 1967 as a turning point, it's sort of surprising from a presentist um, perspective of why there isn't more conflict in this moment. Um, and uh, in, in fact, in part, this is because, so the Jewish community has hard, hardly notices there are Muslims there. And the Muslims, uh, for their part, um, Algerian, Tunisian, largely Algerian, Tunisian, Moroccan, um, North African laborers uh, hardly talk about Palestinians at all. They're not swept up, for the most part, in the struggle uh, in the Middle East, um, despite some effort by some of their organizations to try and um, convince them to be. So one police report from the period, for example, wrote, such efforts, uh, that is, efforts to mobilize Algerian laborers around um, the Palestinian issue, such efforts have failed to mobilize the Algerian masses in France to aid and support the Palestinian resistance. The Algerians, for the most part, are not concerned with the Palestinian matter. Uh, and while this may have overlooked, maybe the police didn't have a great sort of access into the Arabic conversations going on in cafes or in families, it certainly captures the different level of political mobilization. So Jews are highly mobilized in 67, uh, Muslim Algerians are not, and they're not largely talking about this issue. Uh, there's only one place in 67 where we start to find some beginnings of what one might call about conflict around the Middle East. It's really the beginning, uh, and that's on campuses. Um, and it's very sporadic, very, very little bit, um, occasional disagreements, nothing very notable. 
Um, but I think the fact that it begins there helps us understand the far more fundamental shift that occurred in 1968. And here you can see what my argument is, where my argument is heading. I'm going to argue it's a major shift in French political culture, actually, that activates some of these uh, differences. Um, so the Middle East begins to play a role for a reason I'll try to help you understand. Uh, you'll have to bear with me because I have to explain a little bit of detail to you in order for this to make sense. Um, but you can see why then 68 ends up being what I consider to be a major turning point and 67 much less so. Um, so why then does 1968 take student radicals, do, why did 1968 student radicals start talking about the Palestinians and why do North African Muslims who haven't been talking about them in 67 start to become politically mobilized around this issue? Let me try to explain that. Um, so you, I don't know how much you know about France in 1968, but like many places in 1968, there are protests and there are tremendous strikes that um, bring to attention many issues uh, on the social margins of society prior to that time. Feminism, sexual freedom, gay rights, uh, anti-racism. And a big part of this is anti-imperialism and third worldism. A lot of the political leftists of the day are talking about these issues. Uh, and particularly various radical groups, the Maoists, the anarchists, the Trotskyists. Um, while they all differ in strategy and ideology from one another, they express a broad sympathy for a wide um, range of anti-imperial struggles, including for that of the Palestinians. But, and here's where things are interesting, their focus on the Palestinians is not just ideological. It's not just that they are drawn to the issue because it's an anti-imperial struggle. They start using the issue as part of a political strategy to win North African Muslim laborers to their causes. They, the, many of these groups feel um, like they don't have enough support. They want more support in French society. Uh, the communists, for various reasons, follow their own path. And these very left-wing groups that I mentioned um, on the fringes of the political um, left are seeking to have a greater impact. And so they literally, during the riots, they literally go into the urban working class neighborhoods uh, where these Muslims live. They learn Arabic, they, try, they offer French lessons, they offer literacy lessons uh, as a way to try to win over some of these um, workers to their causes. And a focus on Palestinian nationalism becomes central to these efforts as some French radical groups linked the struggle for immigrant rights to their wider anti-imperial and anti-capitalist campaigns. Now, there was one group, and I'll, I'm not going to go into a lot of the detail here, but there's one group that was very famous for this, um, La Gauche Proletarienne, which was a Maoist group. Um, and in 1970, it cooperated with some Algerian, Tunisian, Moroccan, Syrian, and Lebanese students to form the um, Palestine Committee of Nanterre. Nanterre was one of the er working class suburbs that I talked about. Um, so why do these North African students that I told you didn't care much about the Palestinians, why do they start, why do they join this committee and help found it? Um, these are student activists. They're young, like many of you here. Often radicalism tends to find its home on campuses um, of all kinds, radicalism on the left and right. Uh, and um, these students are drawn to radical movements more generally um, because of their commitment to social justice, their criticisms of their home governments. They're very, these, group, these students tended to be very critical of the Moroccan, Algerian, and Tunisian um, governments and their interest in pro-Arab causes more generally. But what they do, and here's where they meet up with the gauchists, with the, with the Maoists on the French left, they start to fuse the issue of immigrant rights in France with the issue of the Palestinians. Um, and um, and it, the Palestinian issue therefore became, comes to play a determinative role in the political generation and the political thinking of a generation of North African activists. So they link the Palestinian revolution to the struggle of all Arab peoples to liberate themselves from exploitation, imperial oppression, labor exploitation, as a way to win over North African Muslims in France to the cause. So I just want to read you here um, a citation from one of the pamphlets that they put out in the working class neighborhoods in uh, Paris. <clears throat> 
So in the working districts of France, we have organized meetings where for the first time since Algerian independence, 800 immigrant and French workers have come together to support the Palestinian revolution. So there's already something funny happening here. It's since the first time since the Algerian revolution that they've come together to support the Palestinians. It's, it's an odd move, particularly since I told you nobody had been talking about the Palestinians. So, and according to the tract's authors, Algerian Muslims should care about the Palestinian plight because it mirrored their own struggle um, to escape Western domination. Um, and so in this way, the Palestinian cause was linked to anti-racist campaigns in France and efforts to better working conditions. So as one minister of the interior report who studied well, not really studied. The, the best sources for immigrants in France are usually police who spied on these different um, working class communities uh, of immigrants. But as one report noted, as the committee mixes the very real complaints of the people in the neighborhood with those concerning the Palestinian issue, they make it necessary to accept or reject both issue as one block. So sort of if you want to fight against injustice in France and you join one of these committees, you also sort of had to become a supporter of the Palestinian movement. They, 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 they went together. Now, all evidence suggests that despite these efforts, most North African Muslim laborers in France had no interest still in the Palestinian issue. So one Afri North African Muslim activist who was active in one of these pro-Palestinian committees wrote uh, later talking about it, um, that he would confront criticism from fellow Muslims in the community who would say to him, you speak to us only of Palestine, us who live in shit, who is going to defend us? So you can see there's, there's certainly some pushback there. Um, but nevertheless, the alliance between French radicals and North African Muslim students brought the Palestinian issue to the French public um, in very, um, public ways, uh, and made um, politically active Muslim students interested in it. What does this have to do with Jews? Well, at the very same time, on the very same campuses, there are Jewish radical students uh, who are engaging in a similar pro process, thanks to French political culture at the moment, a very intensive radicalization. Some of them go very far to the left. Some of them, however, become highly Zionistic, and those groups and I'm not gonna, I don't have time to go through the examples. I can do it later, I can give you examples if you want, but engage in very visible conflict on college campuses around this issue. And when I say visible, I mean they're beating each other up, they're throwing red paint at each other, blood, you know, fake blood, they're and it's both ways. It's not just Muslim students attacking Jews, it's happening both ways, and I can, again, give you examples. We're talking not about everyone, right? It's a handful of student radicals, but you can imagine if you're reading the newspaper and this is what you're reading, the idea that Muslims and Jews are in conflict starts to um, become part of French discourse uh, around this period uh, in much new and surprising ways. Um, and so the, the publicly visible and at times violent confrontations between Muslim and Jewish youth in 1968 result in an increasing polarization around Middle Eastern politics. Um, but, and here's where the story gets interesting to my mind, um, these very divisions uh, and the tumultuous environment also created really unexpected alliances. And I don't know how many people in the room are going to be surprised to know, probably only some of you, that the leader of Le Gauche Proletarien, that Maoist group that um, created the Comédie Palestine, was Jewish. Uh, and in fact, uh, that was not rare at all. Many of the French radical leftists in the Maoist, Trotskyist, and anarchist movements, uh, a, a very disproportionate number, although certainly not all, uh, were in fact Jewish. And this cooperation reminds us that Jewish-Muslim polarization around the Middle East was not a predetermined outcome of ethnic transnational allegiances. Rather, when polarization did emerge, it did so as a product of the political sp space created by late 1960s French radical culture, which both made room for a new generation of Muslim activists who have infused their pro-immigrant politics with the Palestinian issue and pushed France's Jewish population, and particularly its high school and university students, away from traditional affiliations on the left and towards a more combative politics. Um, and the result of this was both that in the public sphere, the issue of Muslim-Jewish polarization sort of entered French national conversation with a certain sense that 
um, it was inevitable uh, that, that widespread conflict was henceforth presumed. Um, and secondly, and maybe more interesting to me, by the mid-1970s, Muslims and Jews had begun to see each other as competitors in some ways in the French public square. And I, here I read you a quote I found so fascinating um, by one of the Jewish communal leaders um, in this period. So this is like, again, the mid-1970s. So he said, our only weapon is public opinion in this country, where we number hardly 1%. Less numerous than the Arabs, who do not have the right to vote, but ballots, alas, count for little, and they can strike, which we cannot. So although these remarks underscored the Jewish insider position as citizens against Arab foreignness, it portrayed them as pitted against each other in the court of public opinion. And in the 1980s, which is my last little chapter here, a new generation of French-born Muslim citizens came of age, uh, which rendered these kinds of distinctions between citizen and foreigner uh, increasingly meaningless. Um, and yet, as a new generation of Muslim activists strove to assert their place in the polity, equal access to all the benefits of French citizenship became a new domain of Muslim Jewish contestation. So this brings me to my third moment, um, and I will cover this briefly, um, of uh, the story, and that is the 1980s. Um, the 1980s were a really interesting moment in France, um, which at least initially seems to dispel entirely any straight line of inevitability intensifying Muslim Jewish conflict. Because in these years, uh, which were marked, for those of you who know French history, in the beginning uh, of the decade by the election of um, Mitterrand as, the socialist, as a socialist president um, of France on a platform of multiculturalism, droit à la différence, the right to be different, um, and a um, sort of an embracing of what sounds like a kind of American multiculturalism, multicultural idea that how we, if we, we are all different, but we all bring something to the, um, to the, com to the national conversation. Uh, and this is a really, to really simplify complex historiographical arguments in, in uh, France, uh, sort of the model that, everyone heard that phrase in the United States, we used to say in this country we were a melting pot, and then we moved to we are a salad bowl. These are all idealized ways of thinking about it, but right, melting pot means we're amalgamating as one. Salad bowl means we all keep our difference, right? So the United States, at least on paper, likes the, likes the salad bowl. The French like the melting pot. This is really, really, really gross simplification, <laughs> but the French model has been a melting pot model, except in the early 80s when the Mitterrand's government said, no, no, where multiculturalism good, it's right, right to be different is important. And in, it creates a moment when certain groups start to uh, make the case that they can assert their difference while working together in what they call a pluricultural um, struggle, where different groups can work together to create a just society. And they create a very, very famous anti-racist movement. Those of you who know France in the 80s know an organization called SOS Racism, which is formed, very famous, powerful, attracts lots and lots of youth uh, mobilization. They have big concerts. They, their way of fighting racism is kind of funny, actually. They hold concerts. <laughs> it's different, it, it, and it's trying to mobilize the youth vote that has, um, the socialists are trying to pull in. But what people often don't know about SOS racism is it was run, it was led by second generation Muslim born French citizens, now those children of Algerian to, um, Moroccan and Tunisian North Africans that I mentioned earlier. It's their children, so they're French, they're citizens, and Jews. There's a major, the, the, the French equivalent to Hillel, uh, it's not called Hillel in France, it's a Jewish campus organization, but that organization is one of the co-founding members of SOS Racism. And for the early years, in the first two years of that organization's um, work, they're talking all the time about um, we're not going to fight the Middle East war on the banks of the Seine. This becomes one of their slogans. Uh, precisely, the Middle East doesn't matter to us. What matters to us is we are French and we have problems to solve in French society together. Um, the Jews who participate in this organization write a lot of articles about how there's so much similarity between Muslims and Jews in France that they're fighting common struggles. Uh, it's a joint anti So it's sort of a har harmonious picture that emerges in these years. Uh, by the end of the 1980s, this alliance collapses. And it collapses 
because the French political moment that I described, that celebration of multiculturalism bursts. And it bursts because the far right political party, the Front National, starts to win large percentages of the vote in France. So something like 14% in one of the highest um, elections in, so you're saying, well, what's that got to do with anything? Well, in response to voter attraction to the far right, both the French center and the French left go back to the melting pot. <laughs> and it's very obvious in their policies. They start to say the only way to be French is for us all to, in the public sphere, to be like one another. We have to do away with difference. And this is most evident in the first, this coincides perfectly with the first headscarf controversy that breaks out in France in 1989 when um, some young girls are expelled from their school for wearing um, the uh, headscarf and a big major debate um, breaks out which doesn't get settled for some period of time. Um, but um, this shift in French political culture leads some Jews who support difference in the public schools um, and difference in French society come out on the side of the headscarf. They say we should be able to wear our difference in public. But a lot of Jews who start to read the tea leaves and see that um, the, the, the melting pot is back, uh, start, instead of stressing the similarities between them and um, Muslims, start talking about their uh, differences. And in the Jewish press, you have a shift to, well, we are, we are citizens, um, we are French, uh, they are not, uh, they are immigrants, they're having trouble assimilating, um, and more division comes up. I'm really simplifying my, the story of the 1980s for your purposes here, uh, but the main point um, then that should be clear is that, again, it's French political culture and shifts in it which foster alliances and then break those alliances down um, in very dramatic ways. And in fact, uh, by the first Gulf War, SOS racism, um, the Jewish leadership from SOS racism quits. They, they walk away and say, we, we can't be part of this organization anymore. Um, and, uh, and there are lots of reasons why that happens, but this is really the major reason. Um, okay, so let me just move to some concluding remarks here. By the end of the um, 1980s then, the much celebrated efforts at cross-ethnic cooperation had given way to distrust and bitterness, uh, and fears of Muslim-Jewish conflict began to take center stage. Uh, by the 1991 Gulf War, journalists, government officials, and religious leaders predicted widespread Muslim-Jewish conflict in response to unfolding events in the Middle East. The fact that these fears never materialized is one of the paradox I've hope I've begun to explain for you. Indeed, whatever their links to the Middle East, and these ties were never homogenous or frozen in time, Muslims and Jews related to each other also as former residents of French North Africa, immigrants competing for limited resources, employers and employees, victims of racist aggression, religious minorities in a secular state, and of course, as citizens. These multiple and complex interactions were often lost, however, as a narrative of polarization took root. When chase, tracing the way Muslim, Muslim Jewish has become shorthand for a rigid opposition politics that has obscured a more complex interethnic landscape, I've sought to trace both the multifaceted origins of the charged political landscape and to underscore its powerful impact. While language of conflict may not accurately describe the daily interactions of most Muslims and Jews throughout the period under study, the emergence of this political landscape shaped the parameters of public discourse and narrowed the range of choices available to those representing communal life. The marked rise in anti-Jewish violence in 2000 emerged from this history of narrowing political categories and also helped solidify them meaning that whatever the diversity of social life on the ground, Muslim-Jewish conflict is likely to remain a salient feature of French political life for the foreseeable future. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I'm going to field questions for anyone who has them. Uh, I realize that was a lot to take in. I have tried very hard to figure out ways to talk about this whole book. Um, and uh, it sometimes uh, leads to a lot of detail, but I'm happy to um, uh, 
flesh out points that weren't clear, and of course to answer anything I left unanswered, and to argue with you if you think I'm wrong, because uh, that often happens when talking about this subject as well. There tends to be people with different points of view, which is totally fine. That's what the Academy is all about. So I'm really happy to hear your feedback and questions. Um, just be polite. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, you've told so far a very North African story, so mm -hmm. I have to ask the question about what the relationship is with West Africans who make up an increasingly percentage of Muslims in France, and you come from a very different Islamic tradition than, say, from those from North Africa. Yeah, that's a really good question, and it gets to that early point I made about heterogeneity, right? right? So. Um, and, uh, and it's a huge problem. In fact, the early readers of the manuscript always said, well, how can you even talk about Muslims and Jews? Because these are not categories that make any sense. First of all, the French officials and the individuals in question didn't even call themselves these things um, for a large period of, uh, particularly the Muslims. Uh, they were most often called in French documents at the time um, of the early period, Arabs, indigenous, North African, they're Algerians, and you know, they're called lots of different things. Um, and so language is problematic. Um, so I'm going to first skirt your question and then try to answer it. So I'm going to skirt it by saying that the um, that over time I started to think, and I, I was trying to reflect this here, that diversity didn't matter very much because actually most West Africans are not, I think, caught. And this is now me trying to answer your question. Not much caught up in the story that I'm talking about here, except now insofar as we're talking about a social inequity issue um, that has um, moved throughout uh, these working class communities that I alluded to. But the way of thinking about the problem erases the difference. So when people talk about Muslims and Jews in France, they're not talking about heterogeneity. They're talking about two polarized groups who you know, not surprisingly, really, when you talk about any political conflict, most people aren't involved, right? It's, it's handfuls of politicized people who are involved. But, and this is the, maybe the more sociological conclusion of the book, that that sort of doesn't matter, because in the process of becoming political categories, that diversity is erased. Um, so, you know, you could even turn your question on its head and say, well, what about forget West Africa, what about most Algerian, Moroccan, and Tunisian Muslims who may like or not like Jews, I don't know what that matters, but who are not engaged in political conflict with them, and most Jews who you know, spend their life hardly interacting with Muslims, it doesn't matter in some ways to this, this story that I'm telling. Does that answer your, sort of answer your question? I, you know, I didn't purposely, because of this issue, break down each subset, because it just ends up being um, a kind of a meaningless uh, way of explaining where we got. Yeah. So this past Thursday in Paris, mm -hmm. uh, a Jew, Jewish man was attacked yes. by a Muslim group, as you know, mm -hmm. and they put a swastika on him. Mm -hmm. And so it's very much still a reality. Absolutely. Um, I'm wondering, given what you've told us about the past and the development of relations, um, especially during the idea of the salad bowl, <laughs> if you think of like a hopeful projection oh. or something you see in the area of growth that could Wow. Well, so one thing I will tell you is historians are terrible predictors of the future. And one of the yeah. reasons I ended this book in 1991, actually, um, was that because everybody, the first question is, well, OK, that's all well and good, but all we care about is the last 10 years. When you, know, you stopped right when it was getting good. Right? Why did you do that? Um, and one of my answers is that historians care a lot about periodization. When do things begin and end? And it was while it was clear to me that something changed in 2000, it's not clear to me where it's headed or what's going to happen next. And so I felt like I would end up not being able to defend the claims that I made about, um, and also methodologically, it's sort of hard for historians to study the contemporary moment. Having said that, everybody asks me, so. <laughs> um, and I would say the answer is complicated. Um, my prognosis is pretty gloomy. Um, and it's, it's pretty gloomy, largely because I think people believe the binary that got created, that I have been, so, uh, and they believe it so dramatically that Jews are leaving France in large numbers, um, actually, for Israel and the United States also, but, um, and if you go to Israel now, you'll find um, big North African, Jewish, French communities. Um, they're not leaving because they were targeted on the street. They're leaving because they know maybe somebody who was, but also because 
this is what everybody's talking about now, right? So that's the way these kinds of things work. They're often also not leaving. They're often buying a second home. And they go there for the summer, and then they say, we're going to retire there. And so there's this idea that there's kind of one foot out the door. But that is, that's back to my point, that once you make that move and then tell it as a story of we have to leave, then more people believe they have to leave, right? The other piece I would add to that is um, why I'm not terribly optimistic. This actually doesn't come so much from my own research, but there's a, um, a book that's recently come out by a scholar named Kimberly Arkin who did some research on um, Jewish private schools in France uh, in the more recent period. And um, what she shows in that book is, a, it, she's not talking about all French Jews, she's really talking about um, Tunisian and Moroccan Jew, descendants of Tunisian and Moroccan Jewish migrants, but who send their children to private schools, to private Jewish schools in very large numbers. Um, and in those schools, she traces um, something that's hardly ever talked about in the press, which is Jewish racism towards Arabs. We have plenty, you, you, you know, and, I, and I'm not saying there's not Muslim anti-Semitism towards Jews, right? That very clearly exists. But nobody ever talks about the other side of it. And what this book makes clear is that both, um, I don't like to use the word community in this case, but both populations uh, have, have bought into the binary. So both of them are now talking about each other in these ways. Not all of them, but enough that this story's kind of gloomy. Having said that, there are counter narratives. There are groups that are working very hard um, to, on joint education endeavors, on uh, pointing out that actually, you know, in all kinds of neighborhoods, people get along just fine, that, um, that, that violence, when it happens tends to be between teenagers, you know, that, that we have to put this into perspective. And, um, but, you know, that's not usually what gets the headlines. Are there other questions? Yes, please. Um, could you relate the things you're talking about also to the growing trends of religiosity and increased mm -hmm. religious affiliation within each of these popular Yeah. Yep, yeah, actually the same, study among, uh, suggests among Jews, and, and you can make the same case among Muslims and, um, uh, and anthropologists who've studied Muslims in France have done so, that when the moment of, um, well, <laughs> but for my simplicity purposes, when the salad bowl collapsed, um, that uh, both the young people, significant subsets of both population, for lack of a better word, turned inward. Uh, and one of the ways they turned inward was um, to more, um, highly, uh, well, let's just say more religious communities. Um, and, and again, this has been traced on both, um, by ethnographers of both populations. Um, and, uh, and so, in fact, um, there has been a growth of interest in Islam among young people and a growth in um, Judaism among um, some of the Jewish populations I'm talking about. I'm a little, uh, you know, the, there are a lot of Jews in France who wouldn't fall into that category, but there, but because, many of the children of Ashkenazic, of those European Jews I talked about, um, for them it's not so true. But uh, among the descendants of these North African Jewish migrants that turn inward, um, fate, you know, if I can link it to my larger argument, are responding to the failure of French society to create its own uh, salad bowl, and in response are sort of turning inward and away from each other, away from the French state, and towards their own religious communities. Um, having said that, I wouldn't want you to walk out of the room and think radical fundamentalism, right? I mean, there are people, and in fact, that's sometimes where the violence comes from, and we know, but that doesn't mean that most people are radical fundamentalists, right? That's the, uh, by any means. Yes, please. Yes, how about uh, demographics as far as population, yeah. So very good question. That is something I talk about in the book that I didn't have time to talk about here. But when you think back to what I was saying about um, the different path of de after decolonization, um, uh, so of course there are many more Muslims than Jews in France. Um, and, uh, but if you were to study them systematically, you would see that um, overwhelmingly Jews are middle class, overwhelmingly. Um, there were the Moroccan and Tunisian Jews did worse than the Algerian Jews because they weren't citizens, but they still had better access because of the Frenchification that they came with to the kinds of opportunities uh, that Muslim unskilled laborers didn't have. And that beginning sort of never levels out. So there are Muslims who have moved into the middle class, absolutely, out of these neighborhoods that I've described, but um, but far fewer. 
And so in terms of access to higher education, in terms of access to um, better jobs, skilled jobs, middle class, um, there are very, there's very different access. And that, of course, is also a big part of the story. It's, that's, it begins with French colonialism. It carries through decolonization. And that's an ongoing problem in the 21st century. Any other questions I can answer? Well, then I think we've solved the problem. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me.